Good evening, everyone. We'd like to welcome you all to the Rogers Memorial Library. My name is Penny Wright. I'm the director of adult programs here. And we're very delighted to have uh, a discussion tonight by an esteemed, acclaimed, I should say, officially acclaimed author. <laughs> We'd like to thank uh, C-SPAN, Book TV, for being here with us this evening. And when we progress to the question and answer segment, um, we will have a handheld microphone for you all to use when you ask your questions. We're also grateful to our local independent bookstore, Canio's Books, for being here this evening as well. We're most happy and grateful, however, to our visitor, our guest, uh, Lawrence Goldstone. And I'll tell you a couple of things about him. He is the author or co-author of more than a dozen books of fiction and nonfiction, six written with his wife, Nancy, and has written extensively on both American and European history. Larry has been widely interviewed on both radio and television with appearances on The Diane Rehm Show, on Fresh Air, To the Best of Our Knowledge, The Faith Middleton Show, The Takeaway, and Tavis Smiley and now at the Rogers Memorial Library. <laughs> His work has been profiled in the New York Times, the Toronto Star, Salon, and Slate, and his articles, reviews, and opinion pieces have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, and Hartford Current. Larry's current book, Birdmen, The Wright Brothers, Glenn Curtis, and the Battle to Control the Skies, Reviewed, uh, received star, starred reviews in Publishers Weekly and Library Journal. It was chosen as one of the best books of the year, so far, by Time Magazine, and was the subject of an entire column by Joe Nocera in the New York Times. It also received glowing reviews in the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Nature, USA Today, and the Christian Science Monitor. Larry is an eclectic fellow and has been a teacher, a lecturer, a senior member of a Wall Street trading firm, a taxi driver, an actor, a quiz show contestant, and a policy analyst at the Hudson Institute. He currently lives in Sagaponic. We're very delighted to have uh, Larry and his wife, Nancy, and their family on the east end of Long Island. Please welcome Larry Goldstone. Well, thank you, Penny. That was wonderful. And thank you all for coming. Um, as those of you who are familiar with my work know, uh, I don't specialize in any one topic. I've written on uh, history of medicine, science, law, rare books, baseball. Um, I'm always, I'm looking for subjects where the, there's, a, there's some current parallel with a historical topic, something that's acute, something that can, that can illuminate the past and the present at the same time. This book I found through my favorite method of finding a topic, and I, I stumbled on it. It was just complete luck. I had been co-authoring a book uh, on a, the biography of a Hall of Fame, New York Yankee Hall of Fame baseball pitcher named Lefty Gomez, and I was doing this with his daughter. And Lefty pitched in the 1930s. He was Babe Ruth's best friend. He was Joe DiMaggio's roommate. And Lefty was known for eccentric behavior and a series of kind of bizarre statements. Uh, what I discovered working, his daughter did this amazing job of, it, of getting, of interviewing Lefty before he died. And what I discovered about Lefty was that he was a highly intelligent guy with a voice somewhere between Mark Twain and the great sports writer Ring Lardner. And it very much belied the public image. But in public, Lefty was a very strange person indeed. And one of, the, one of his famous loves was aviation. And in 1937, 
lefties stop pitching in a World Series game on the mound in front of a packed stadium to watch an airplane fly overhead. This was one of, this was one of lefties. Now, what is less known about this story is that it was the bottom of the seventh inning and the Yankees were ahead like 11 to 2. So it wasn't quite as inflammatory as it, as it came down through history, but it was a big deal nonetheless. What I discovered was that Lefty had acquired his love of aviation as a six-year-old boy in 1915 at the San Francisco World's Fair watching the most famous aviator of the age, a man named Lincoln Beachy. Now, I had never heard of Lincoln Beachy, and I did a little research, and what I discovered was that not only was Lincoln Beachy the most famous aviator or the greatest aviator of that age, but with apologies to Chuck Yeager, he was the greatest, probably the greatest aviator of any age. The things Lincoln Beachy did were so astounding that you wouldn't, people wouldn't believe them except that he did them in front of hundreds of thousands of people. In a country where the population was like 75 million, an estimated 20 million people saw Lincoln Beachy fly. To give you an example, at the first great air fair, the great uh, Chicago air fair in September of 1910, Beachy desperately wanted to break the altitude record. The altitude record at the time was 11,200 feet. Now you have to remember, these people flew in airplanes that were completely open. There was no cockpit, it was just a frame. And they flew in suits, and the only way they could keep warm was to stuff newspapers in their clothes. And Beachy discovered that in the only way to break the altitude record was to use all his fuel on the way up. <laughs> so the last day of the fair, toward dusk, the megaphone man, that's what they had, there was a grandstand, there was a grandstand that held about 30,000 people, and there were half a million people packed along the lakefront. There are photos, there's just people packed the entire lakefront. The megaphone man goes up and down, tells everyone Lincoln Beachy is going to try for the altitude record. Beachy goes up. Sure enough, he gets to 11,641 feet. And they know this because they had a thing called a barograph that they mounted on the plane that used air pressure to measure altitude, which I don't completely understand, but it seemed to work. He's a dot in the sky. Half a million people are watching. And all of a sudden, the dot starts to circle, gets larger and larger and larger, and the people see that the propeller isn't moving because Beachy had used all his fuel on the way up. And he's out over the lake where if he crashes, he's going to certainly die. He circles down. And in front of half a million people, he lands his airplane in front of the grandstand, not 200 feet from where he took off. Now that is flying. <laughs> Beachy's signature trick he called the dip of death. He would take his airplane 3,000 feet, 5,000 feet in the air, and then head straight down. Sometimes he would cut his engines. Sometimes he would put his arms out and control the airplane with his knees. And when it seemed like it would be impossible for him not to crash, he'd pull out and either perfectly land or go off and do some more tricks. This, he was the only person who could do this. And at least six aviators and maybe as many as a dozen died trying to what they called do a beachy because he was so famous. Um, in those days, flying near Niagara Falls was certain death. The wind currents were terrible. The spray would foul the motor. Beachy, not only in front of 100, 150,000 people, goes, he flies under a bridge, goes to one of the falls on the Canadian side, and basically flies straight up it. In the, he, was, he, he had an interesting sense of humor. He, um, in, the, in the next Chicago Air Fair in 1911, also in front of half a million people, Beachy announces that he has trained a woman, a French woman, named Clarisse Lavasseur to fly, and that Cl Clarisse Lavasseur can fly as well as any man. Now, they had women aviators in those days, and one of which I'll talk about later, but there weren't a lot of them. And sure enough, the megaphone man comes, a woman comes out, Clarisse Lavasseur, she's a short, relatively stocky woman wearing a heavy coat to keep warm and a big hat, and she gets in the airplane and takes off. It is immediately apparent that Clarice Levasseur is not a particularly adept aviator. First thing she does is buzz the grandstand, and everybody has to duck. Then 
then the, the plane maneuvers wildly and goes out over Michigan Avenue, flying so low that the wheels of the airplane are actually bouncing along the tops of the automobiles on Michigan Avenue. <laughs> the plane goes again and goes out over Lake